so this is the first of the two-part lecture on OLTP indexes. So last class was a discussion of adding index or latching and locking inside of indexes, right? The locking is for high-level logical things like can I lock this individual key? And then the latching stuff is now for the internal data structure of how do you protect the critical sections. So in today's class, the lecture is going to be all about how do we build indexes that don't use any latches at all. We're still going to need the higher level locking stuff that we talked about before, uh, or being able to check for phantoms in other ways, like, we, like in Hyper or in Cicada or Hecaton doing additional scans. But today's class is really how, how can we build data structures without any uh, latches at all. So the, uh, the first thing I want to bring up, though, is for project number two, uh, we merged in some code uh, yesterday into the master branch that will make it easier for you guys to debug the contents of your index. So we add some helper methods to print out what's the, uh, you know, what's the values of the keys that I have and, what's, what's, and what are the keys and what are my values. Um, there's no single method or deep, uh, utility method where you can throw in a pointer to your index and it'll, and it'll print out a nice table that, uh, with everything you have in it. Um, this is because some indexes, as we'll see next class, like art, for example, doesn't actually uh, expose what keys it actually has. Right? In your skip list, you'll be able to do this. You want to add some debug methods for your, for your own implementation that allows you to print out exactly what's in there. And so the stuff we added should, should make it easier to do that. I mean, in general, I'll say that your implementation should match the behavior of the BW tree as much as possible, although we, we may have found a bug yesterday in the BW tree. Uh, but for, for getting started, this should be okay. And the other thing, too, is that I'll send out an email to everyone uh, either today or tomorrow uh, with information on how to get access to the um, machines that we have available for you in the course. So when I first taught the course in 2016, Mem Siegel graciously donated some uh, three machines that, that you all can log into and run whatever experiments or testing that you want on there. So I think each machine is like, Two, so two CPU sockets with 16 threads per socket with plus hyperthreading, so you have 24 threads in total. And then each machine also has like 128 gigabytes of RAM. So way more than you have in your laptop. So if you want to do you know, hardcore scalability experiments, you should use these machines. Again, you have root access. You can log into them, trash them, whatever, do whatever you want with them, and they get wiped every 24 hours. So you can't, you can't actually do any real damage. Okay? So I'll, I'll, again, I'll post on Piazza how to, how to get access to this, and then you'll get an email from... Uh, the internal PDL people that says, here's your password, here's, here's how you go to log in, okay? All right, so for today's lecture, uh, we're gonna talk, as I said, the goal is to talk about lat tree indexes, um, but I'm listing three types of uh, indexes here. Only the last two are actually lat, uh, lat tree. The first one, T-tree, we'll talk about for historical reasons. Uh, this was the first in-memory index that they built in the 1980s. Nobody actually does them anymore. Uh, except maybe with some rare exception. Um, and so we'll see this and see what people did back then, but you don't actually want to do this now, and then you want to, these, these are actually the more modern implementations, okay? So back in the 1980s, uh, systems machines were way more memory constrained than we are now. Um, and so when people start, first started thinking about, can I build a database system where the, that's entirely in memory, um, they were sort of focused on this idea of, of how can we reduce the amount of mem memory you actually have to use as much as possible. And so T-trees are, are one solution to this problem. So the basic idea of the T-tree is that instead of storing the actual keys to the attributes that the index is based on, we're going to instead store pointers to the tuples. And then if any time you need to figure out what that original key was, you'd have to follow the pointer and look up the original value. Right? And you did this because... Back then on these machines, the pointers were probably 16 bits, right? And that's going to be way less to store 16 bits to the original value rather than having the duplicated, duplicated value. So the other aspect of this that actually matter too is that uh, the, the speed difference between uh, uh, CPU caches and DRAM are not as significant as they are now, right? Back in the 1980s, you didn't have L3 cache. Uh, your L1, L2 was, was not, you know, super, super fast compared to what DRAM could do. So paying the penalty for a cache miss in this environment isn't as bad as it is now. So for them having to go do this lookup and say, what's the actual key that I'm, that I'm checking, uh, 
that was that was considered okay, and that was that was a trade off they were willing to make because they had limited amounts of memory. So the tea trees came out of uh, the University of Wisconsin in Madison uh, by Dave DeWitt and others during the 1980s. So Wisconsin did some early awesome work on in-memory databases, but these were mostly all in, in simulators. Uh, nobody actually, because you, know, you couldn't actually, you know, have enough DRAM on a single machine to do this. Um, but in the 1990s, a bunch of in-memory, uh, commercial in-memory databases came out like Times 10, uh, Data Blitz, or Dolly from AT&T, and they all end up using uh, tea trees again, because this was considered the, the way to build an in-memory index, right? But nowadays, n none of the modern in-memory systems actually still use tea trees. So here's what it looks like. So it's going to be like a tree structure, uh, just like, like a B plus tree or a B tree, uh, and the name tea tree, come, the T in the tea tree comes from, is that the nodes are, are designed to look like uh, T's at a high level. So within a single node, uh, we're going to have the po pointers to the actual tuples themselves. So again, I'm not storing the actual copies of the keys. I just have pointers to the tuples. right? So I have, this, is, this will be a sorted array where the pointers are sorted on the value of the key that the, the index is based on. right? And then I have my pointers to my left child and my, my le left child and right child to go down below in the tree. But another big distinction between the, the you know, B tree or B plus tree is that I also have a pointer to my parent, right? Because with the way I'm going to do traversal is not like a B plus tree where you always go to the leaf node and then you find exactly what you want. You may have to go up, up and down to different levels. Question? Is it even stored like integers as pointers? So your question is, do they store integers as pointers? What do you mean by that? Well, like, is that like they store everything in one of the pointers? Right. So, so if I have if I have a table, and I have three attributes A, B, C. If my index is on attribute A, I don't store that value of A here like I would in a B plus tree. Even the value is like in here. Yeah. If, yeah. Correct. If the value, if if the value is a 16-bit integer, yes. and my pointer is a 16-bit integer, they still store the pointer, right? Because if I store the key yes. directly in here. I also have to store the pointer to get to the tuple that I wanted. So in that case, for your example, the, if the, if the, key, the attribute I'm, I'm based on is 16 bits, I still need another 16 bits to have the pointer. So you, you just have the pointer, right? It's like the minimum you need, information you need, to be able to go jump and find the thing you want, all right? All right, so the only copy of the value they're going to maintain are these min and max key values. So this, this won't be pointers, this will be actual, the actual values. And you need this to represent, represent the boundaries of the, 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 the range that's managed or, or stored here within, within a single node. All right? So again, th this will be based, you know, if, if your integers are 16-bit 16, 16 or 32-bit, you would have to have a copy of those keys in there. All right? So let's see how you'd actually search on this. So let's say this is my key space. I'm having keys 1 through 7, right, Going, sorting from low to high. The way I'm going to represent this is in a T tree is not going to be like in a B plus tree where everything is in sorted order along the leaf nodes. Instead, I'm going to assert entries in breadth first order, like this. Right? So now what happens is say I want to do a lookup between the range 2 and 5. I start at the root node. I check to see the, if the value I'm looking for is within my range. It's not, right? Because they say this is the key space of 4. 2 is less than 4, so I would know that uh, uh, my min key is, is, less than the, is greater than the thing I'm looking for. So I would go down to my left child pointer, same thing, do it, do it, and I would land here. And now we check is in my range. I have a match, so I know I need to go find whatever it is. I have to follow these pointers now to go get the actual tuples and do whatever additional computation I need while I'm processing the query. But then I jump down and go down here to 3 to get, go across. And then if when I get to four, I got to go back up. And that's why they need the pointers to go in the reverse direction, because you're doing this in, in breadth first order. All right? So this is, this is a, uh, you know, for the space aims you get from not having stored some additional pointers or some additional copies of keys, you're going to pay a penalty of having to do more traversals. Yes? So at the, the root node, wouldn't the min k be No, so, yeah, so, so his question is, wouldn't the, the key range for this node here at the root 
wouldn't this be one through seven because I need to store everything within this? Uh, no, because if it's one through seven, that means that this key has exactly what I want, right? So I, maybe I should draw this better. So this would have four to four to five, uh, four inclusive, five exclusive. So I would do my look up here, and I to get the actual value, I got to go down this side, right? So it's not. Don't think of this like a, like a B plus tree where the the inner nodes are just guideposts to say go left or right. It's the actual data itself. So the data you need is not within this range, and the min key tells you to go this direction to get it. His question is, is it one record per node? Uh, no, it's, yeah, so I, I, again, I should, draw this, I should draw this better, right? So this could be a range of values, okay. yeah. All right, so the advantages of the tea tree is that it uses less memory because we don't have to store the keys, right? And then we don't have additional copies of keys like you would in the B plus tree in the inner nodes because uh, the, the inner nodes themselves are actually the, the, where the data can be stored as well in, in a tea tree. The obvious downside of this is in a tea tree, it's difficult to rebalance because because the, the breath first breath first breath first search ordering, we may have to go muck around the tree in a bunch of different ways. Um, and of course, now that means that the rebalancing is more is more complex. It's going to be difficult to implement this concurrently uh, and, and or allow multiple threads to do, do modifications to the index uh, without blocking the entire tree or locking the entire tree when you make a change. And of course, the other big issue is that we have to chase pointers whenever we have to scan ranges uh, because we have to perform that binary search um, uh, within, it, within the node, and we have to go look up you know, the pointers to see what's the actual value that I'm looking for. Right? So again, this is more of a historical anomaly or a historical artifact that I like bringing up because it often comes up where people say, you know, we're building an in-memory index or in-memory database, and we're going to use you know, a B plus tree. And someone would always say, well, wait a minute, didn't people design indexes be exactly for in-memory uh, storage, like a tea tree? And aren't they better? And the answer is no, because the way this does, this, this is actually being organized, um, is really slow because of that indirection of having to go follow the pointers to, in your node to go look up the actual value in, in the tuple itself. Right? So as I said, in the 1990s, um, times 10 dataless were, dataless were using this. As far as I can tell from the documentation of times 10, uh, it's actually not clear to me whether they're using B plus trees or, uh, or, or T trees. So some document, the manual from 2006 from Oracle says they use T trees, but then a recent blog article from June 2017 says they're using B plus trees. So I sent an email this morning to one of the developers at Oracle and he didn't get back to me yet. Um, but the only other system, that, a notable system that, that I know that also uses T-Tree is, is ExtremeDB, which is an embedded database system. So don't think like embedded, like think embedded device, like not your cell phone, but like, like an IoT or sensor device, like where you're really memory constrained. And in their system, they, they use T-Trees, right? Your cell phone has a, lot of, has a lot of memory, right? Your cell phone has like two gigs or four gigs. In that case, you use SQLite. That's an awesome database system. And SQLite uses, uses a B plus tree. Right, so T trees are, are are interesting. If you're really memory constrained, this is what you want to use. But if now, if you're if you're building, you know, in a large memory system, uh, as we'll see throughout through today's lecture, next lecture, there's better implementations, better better indexes that are willing to pay the penalty of having to store keys in the inner nodes or additional copies of keys. Um, but for modern CPU architectures, they're better because you don't have that indirection problem. Okay. All right. So now, with that said. Now we start talking about how to build uh, a modern index. So as I said last class, the, the way to think of an index is that it's essentially like a glossary in a textbook that allows you to do a lookup on some key and jump to the, the, the exact page that, you, that has the thing that you're, that you're looking for. And so the easiest way to implement a dynamic order preserving index is, is, a, is as a sorted linked list. And so the key word in my, in my description here is the word dynamic. Right? That essentially means that we don't know a priori, we don't know when the system boots up exactly how many keys we're going to have and what, the, what their actual values are. So dynamic means that someone can be inserting and deleting things over time, right? and we need to be able to accommodate that. So the easiest way to implement this, to be able to handle changes to an index, 
is as a, a sorted linked list, right? And the, the reason why I'm saying it's easy, easy is because when I want to insert or delete an entry, I only have to find the thing that I'm trying to modify, and then I just flip one pointer to now point to my new thing, right? So if I have key four, key five, and I want to insert something in between there, I just have to change this pointer, right? It's super easy. It's not like in a, in a B plus tree where I could have a split and I call it, could cause changes all the way to the root to the tree and have the thing be completely reorganized, right? The change I can make if I, if I use a linked list is localized. But now, the problem with this is that if I didn't want to do, do, look up a key, it now is going to be a linear search or a linear scan across every, every single uh, element potentially, right? Because these are pointers to some other location in memory, it's not like an array where I can just jump to an offset where I think my thing is going to be and do maybe do binary search. I had to scan and go across and look at, it, and look at everything. So what's one obvious solution to this problem? How can I speed, speed this up? Yeah, the answer is skip list, but like, <laughs> does everyone already know what a skip list is and if we just skip this? Okay, so the answer is you basically have extra pointers now that can jump over, uh, jump to, to over one element or one key in my, in my list and get to the next one, right? I can do this for every single one, right? So now if I want to look up, say, key four, whereas without these, I have to do a linear scan to land here, but now with this, I can jump, I can look at this and say, well, I'm looking for key four. Key, th key four is greater than key three, so I can skip whatever's in here and just jump to that. Now I do my load lookup, I'm looking for key four. Key four is less than key five, so I know I need to now scan across this. And I can do, I can do the same thing. I can have one now skip uh, every four elements like this, every four keys, right? This is essentially what a skip list is, right? So a skip list is gonna have multiple levels of linked lists with these extra pointers to allow you to skip over intermediate nodes that, that, that you know don't have the data that you're looking for, right? And the big advantage that I, you get in a skip list is the same thing as a linked list, because it's just essentially just a bunch of linked lists, is that when I make modifications, uh, those are localized to the elements I'm, I'm modifying, like either the guy that comes before or after me, and I don't have to do major rebalancing across uh, the entire data structure, right? And that's one of the big advantages you get out of a skip list. So what makes a skip list actually special beyond just what my simple example where I said jumped over every other is that it is a probabilistic data structure. And so that means that instead of saying, I'm always, I'm, I'm gonna build an extra pointer to skip over every second element or third element, you're gonna end up flipping a coin and decide randomly uh, how many extra jumps you, you're gonna have, right? So again, the way to think about this is you're gonna have different levels. At the lowest level, it's always been that single direction linked list that's in sort of order, right? You need that because you can't have false positives, false, or sorry, false negatives, right? If anybody does a, does a scan across the, the, leaf, the leaf nodes or the, the lowest level, you want your key to actually be there, right? Because otherwise it's not there. So the lowest level has to have everything. But then in the second level, you basically want uh, links to every other key, and then third level, you get every fourth key, and so forth, right? The idea is that as you go up from level to level, you want one level to have half as many as links as the level below it. And so the way you can do this is that when you insert a new key, you, you always have to put it at the lowest level, but then you flip a coin and say, if it's heads, I'll add an extra link. If it's tails, I'll just stop. I won't add an extra link. And so if you get heads, you add the extra link, you flip it again, because now you're going up to the next level, next level, and you say, should I add it, yes or no? And you keep doing this until you get heads. So what happens is you essentially end up uh, with the, uh, a data structure that is technically random, but on average, you'll get, a, you'll get approximately log n searches like you would in a, uh, in a B plus tree. So it's like having a B plus tree without having to have a rigid, rigid uh, uh, data structure in terms of, uh, you know, every node has to be at least half full and all that kind of stuff, right? And it gets, again, get that benefit of only how to make localized changes. So let's look at an example here. All right, so the first thing to point out is that along my link list, I have my starting point and my end point, right? So my end point, I'll just have a, uh, a marker that says infinity or null or nil, Right, this basically says that if you're traversing this linked list and your pointer lands in one of these spots here, you know you're at the end of the list. 
right? Then at the beginning of the list, then I'm going to have my uh, starting point links for each level. And for each of these levels will correspond to the probability that the, a given key will be at this level. So at the bottom, the probability is always one or every, every element because you have to have every element. And then above this, you're going to have half as many keys. And above that, you have half as many keys as the one below this. Right? So again, this is the linked list that I showed at the very beginning uh, in my sort of toy example. I have to have everything. And then above this, we're going to have uh, pointers to allow us to jump to the next key or, uh, that's in our level. But we also have to have pointers to go down uh, the, the tower. right? So sort of think of these vertical strips here are called towers. So if I'm going along and I say, all right, I know I need K2, I know how to go down here and actually and get it. Okay? And then above here, we don't, we don't have any keys yet. So this is our sort of top level, and it just points immediately to, to, to the, end, the end point. All right, so let's do an example where we want to insert key five. So key five would go here, right? Uh, and so you'd first do a traversal, and you'd find out I, want, I, I have key four and I have key six. This is where I think I want to put it, right? So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to copy it in. Uh, but at this point, I haven't updated any pointers, so nobody actually knows about it. So key four here still points to key six, and this one points, points to the end here. So then what I'm going to do is go in and, and install my pointers. And now everything becomes visible. So I'm being very hand wavy at how to do this. I'll go in more details in a second because you have to, the order you do these, you know, in, install these pointers is important because you could end up having some, something point to nothing. Um, but the basic idea is, is the same. I, I flipped the coin. Uh, I, I installed key five here. I flipped the coin, got heads, added to the, to the first level, flipped the coin again. I added one to the second level in this tower. I flipped it a third time. I got tails, so I don't add anything ab above me. Yes. Question or no? no. And so, the how many levels I go up per key is localized to that key. So just because this one got up to the, to the third level, I don't need to go back and add anybody else, right? Questions? Yes. If you have to sort of keep flipping points until. So his question is, um, let's take the extreme case. Say I'm super lucky or unlucky, depending on your view, and I flip a coin 100 times, and I get heads 100 times in a row, right? Would my tower go all the way up? Um, it depends on implementation, right? From a correctness standpoint, it doesn't matter, right? Uh, anybody will be able to find the thing that I need. In practice, though, right, in terms of probability, that's very unlikely to happen. So the, the tree sort of balances itself out automatically. Question, yes? Do we store any additional information at the starting levels? His question is, do I store any additional information at the starting level, such as what? Like, if you want to search for K6, yes. do I still take the topmost level? Okay. How do you know that you have to take that? All right, so, well, Next slide, we'll see how to do a search. You had a question? No, yes. Uh, does it store like parent pointers at every level? So his question is, do you store parent pointers at a, at a read level? No. Okay. Right? And the reason is because when we start doing making this concurrent, you need, you need to do compare and swap. You can only compare and swap on a single location. So you only have pointers uh, to your neighbor, or in this case here, to, to your the guy below you in the tower. So when you're actually flipping the coin, you go to every level and search and go through the list. The your question is, if I'm, if I'm flipping a coin, uh, would I go through every single level and do a search? Yeah, from the beginning to the end and find out where you want to actually search. So, uh, yes, we'll, we'll come, let's see how to do uh, uh, search and we'll come back to that. Yes. Any other questions? Okay. Let's do a final K3. So, so uh, Preetham's question was before was, do I store any additional metadata here in the starting point to allow me to jump to a location? The answer is no, right? So if I'm doing a lookup on K3, I just go down each level and I try to find where do I enter into the data structure. So in this case here, I start at the top level, I'd follow this pointer, it would take me to key five. And I would say, well, key three is less than key five, so I know whatever I, you know, the, the key that I'm looking for, key three, cannot be at this point or beyond. It'll, it's going to be on this side of the index. So I don't want to jump, I don't want to go across and follow that pointer. 
I want to go down to the next level. Same thing, now I do comparison, and now K3 is gr greater than K2, so I know that anything below this, going this direction, I don't need to look at. So it's in, somewhere in this range between key to, K2 and K5. So I want to follow now along this pointer, and then I do my comparison. Again, K3 is less than K4, so I don't want to go follow this. And I, ju I jump down here, and I follow along, and then I find the thing I'm looking for. So his, his suggestion was, can we provide hints about things like, hey, if you're looking for K6, uh, go along this path or something like that. You don't want to do that because you get that for free because you have to look at these pointers to see what the actual key is to see whether you want to go and, and follow along this, this path or go down, down to another level. All right, so the advantages of a skip list is that in practice, you end up storing typically less, uh, use less memory than a B plus tree uh, because you're not storing uh, additional, uh, you're, not, you're not having a much way more pointers and a lot more redundant copies of, uh, of your data. Um, and this is only true actually if you're storing reverse pointers. So in this case here, all the pointers are sort of going in, in like one direction, right? In a, in a B plus tree, you have, you have to have left and right, right, as you, as, as you go down. So because everything's always going in one direction, uh, we're going to have to let, use less memory. Um, the insertions and deletions don't require any rebalancing because the, the, the change is always localized to wherever you are on the index or in the, in the list. Um, and it's actually, as we'll see in the next few slides, you can actually make this thing be concurrent and thread safe just by using compare and swap. Yes. So does it have like less memory than B plus tree? Because like you know, being B plus tree can contain like a number of items while a skip list, but no, it only contains one. So your question is, I think your statement is, uh, yeah. is it is it the case? Sorry, yeah. His, his statement is, in my example here, I'm showing at a single node. All right, say this is a node or element in my in my skip list that has one key and value pair and then a pointer. But in the B plus tree, you can pack in multiple keys and values in a single node and get, get better locality or, or you know, less, less pointers and, and better that way. You can do the same thing in a skip list. We'll see that later. All right. All right. So let's talk about how to build a concurrent one. So as I said, we can do insertion and deletion in our skip list without any locks or latches using only compare and swap. But the key thing to understand is that the... The reason why we have to have our, our single direction linked list, or single, you know, go, only going from, from left to right, is because the compare and swap instruction can only update a single memory location atomically. So if I have, if I have to have reverse pointers and I want to insert a new, a new entry, I got to go update, uh, in, go update the, the predecessor and the successor to now point to my new guy, and I can't do that atomically without having to do latches. Yes? Two pointers into the same word or something? So his, his question is, can I just cram two pointers into the same word? I yes, and you can. I actually don't. I can. Do they have sixty-four bit compare and swap? Or sorry, one hundred twenty-eight bit compare and swap? Well, it doesn't matter if because pointers are really just forty-eight bits, right? So, so not. Are, I can. Not starting later this year. Oh. Yeah. But even then, if you have two 48-bit pointers, you have to have a 96-bit 90, compare and swap. I guarantee they don't support that. They, they might have 128. But it, it, potentially, yes, we can, we can sit and think about it, but in practice, I don't, I, nobody does this. All right? all right, so let's go back and do our insert, and let's see how to do this atomically. So as I said, we do a traversal to figure out where we, for, to, to figure out where we actually need to be, right? And this needs to, say we're assuming that this is a unique index, so we have to do this traversal anyway to see whether our key already exists. So we figure out that this is, this is where, where we want to go, right? So the first thing we're going to do is we're going we're to create our indexes after flipping the coin, or create our, our, our entries for every level in, in our tower. But at this point here, nobody knows about our key because we haven't updated any pointers. Right? So these original pointers for key four, they're just still going around and pointing at whatever they, they were looking at before. Same thing for, for the starting point here. So we can update all our, our entries here as much as we want uh, without worrying about whether we're going to interfere with anybody else, because no one can land on us and figure out what we actually contain. 
So that means that we can install our pointers going down into to the to the tower, and then we can also have pointers to uh, what we think is is the next entry uh, in in the list, like that, right? But now we need to install this and have it now become visible. So we're going to start from the bottom and go to the top, and we're going to do a compare and swap on our predecessor's pointer. So, right? So this is again a single instruction. I know what I think should be there because I did my traversal the first time to figure out, oh, it's actually pointing to K6. So when I do my compare and swap, if that pointer is now no longer pointing to K6, I know that somebody else has come along and inserted or deleted something before, you know, before I can make my change, and therefore I need to abort my operation, go back and try it again. But now, but if it is pointing to K6, and I'm able to do the compare and swap, so I'm now successful, and now K4 points to K5. So now this point here, the key is technically uh, visible and valid in our, in our index. Even though we haven't updated any of the other pointers in, in other levels, anybody that does a traversal here will, should be able, will, will be able to find us, right? So then I can do the same thing, compare and swap for this guy, have him point to this, compare and swap to that guy, and have him point to that. And now our index, our key is, is fully installed in our index. Yes? So as you do your insert, you have to like remember the last node size. Yeah, so his question is, in order to do an insert, I mean, think about this. To do an insert, you have to know where you're going to insert. So you have to do a lookup, you know, do a traversal, find out where you think you should be, and yes, you have to you have to save that because you want to be, be able to install yourself. And as well, I what what so so his question is his statement is if you had parent pointers like going the other direction, you you wouldn't have to save that right. But then you can't okay. yeah you you can't do that atomically. So his question is um, same here. Right, and say someone deletes something, delete you delete K four, and then now we're gonna now we have the problem of of our uh, so we, be careful here. We'll, we'll talk about this in a second. There's physical deletion and logical deletion. I can do logical deletion. The 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 chunk of memory for key, key four is still K four is still here, so I can do my compare and swap, and I'll, I'll still be in my in, installed correctly in the linked list. That memory for K4 won't actually be reclaimed until later. And this we'll see this in garbage collection. The index will figure out that, oh, I know no thread could be looking at this chunk of memory, so therefore it's safe for me to delete. So even if someone deletes this, it's a logical delete, so it's still there. If someone deletes this, again, logical delete, it's still there, and my, my pointers are okay. Yes? Uh, in the compare and swap page, we don't have to go and change the successor Level, right? We just retry in that level. Yeah, so his, so his, his statement is, or question is, say I'm able to do this compare swap successfully, but then now if I get to this guy and I try to compare the swap, this fails. I don't need to roll this back, right? I just need to retry it. I just, and I have to figure out, well, you know, because it could be a race condition. Maybe somebody else got, got here and then they got here before me because they don't know about K5 yet, right? It's, you just retry it, right? <coughs> Yes? If uh, K4 is logically deleted, um, the compare and swap will still succeed, but if K6 is deleted, um, the pointer from K4 to K6 won't be changed. Both the compare and swap still succeeds, so then K5 will point to K6, but both K4 and K6 are deleted. Okay, so this back this backs up. All right, K4 is logically deleted. Yeah. Right? So it's still here. It's still going to, we can do a compare and swap, it's still pointing to K5. Then, you're, then you said K5 is deleted, or sorry, K6. Before the comparison swap happens, K6 is deleted. Logically or physically? Has to be has to be logically. logically. Okay. Okay. So it's logically deleted. So then K4 is still pointing to K6 because we don't update the, the pointer because K4 is still deleted. But we still think it's valid. No, so 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 it'll be marked again, I'll show deletion in a second. It'll be marked as logically deleted, uh, but people are still gonna find it. Because there's still there's still a pointer back here that's pointing to it, right? So even though K4 will be logically deleted, K6 is logically deleted, someone will still be able to find our K5. My point is, wouldn't, wouldn't we think that the, the next thing is K6 still? 
At this point here, if I, if I have this set up here, say so K. Marriage bar is successful. We don't have K4 funding K4. You're here. Yeah. Okay. So this is logically deleted. Yeah. Pointer still points to K6. K6 is logically deleted. That's fine. My guy comes along and says, well, even though he's, he's deleted, uh, I still have to add myself in here, right? So I do my compare and swap, that's fine. But then doesn't K5 think K6 is the next guy? Doesn't K5 think K6 is the next guy? It, it is. Okay, so that was deleted? Logically, it's still there, okay. right? It won't, it's not visible. Sorry, yeah, physically it's still there, logically it's not, right? Like, let me, I think, boom, all right, let's just jump to this, okay. This is a clear all. all right, so again, we're gonna have this distinction between logically and logically being removed and physically being removed. Logically, basically, we add a little flag, an 8-bit eight, eight flag in, in the node now that says this, this entry has been deleted. So if you scan along and you see that, you know you should ignore it, right? Physically deleted, as we'll, we'll talk about later when we do garbage collection, this is when we, we can remove the actual contents of the entry from memory, and nobody when we know that nobody else could be, could be looking at it, and we know there's no pointer possibly to this. This is easy to do, this is harder to do, so we'll, we'll go through both of these. All right, so let's say I want to delete key, K, K5. So now in every single node, again, I have my, little, my, my single Boolean flag to say whether this, is thing, this, this entry is deleted or not. And I only need it at the leaf nodes, I don't care about the towers, or the, the ending and, and the higher levels. So I want to delete K5, so I do my traversal, I find K5, I get down here, and then I do a flip on this, and I, I mark it as deleted, right? I don't think this has to be compare and swap, right? If you try to see whether it's deleted, and you get there and somebody, already, somebody else already deleted it, then you know that you can, just, you, can, you can bounce out, you're done, because someone else already did it for you, right? So now I set this thing as deleted, and... I now, if anybody comes along and they, they, they're looking for K5 and they would find me, they know they can ignore me. Or if you're traversing along, K3, K4, K5, K6, you know that, again, you, you can just ignore this. But all the physical pointers are still valid, right? So now I, I gotta start cleaning this, this thing up by removing all my pointers. So I'll start from the, the top and go down and I'll do compare and swap to replace uh, whatever is pointing to my, my different entries at each, each level to now point to whatever com, comes, comes after me. So in this case here, this top level here was pointing to the end, so I want to do a compare and swap to replace this to now instead of pointing to me, to point to the end. All right? same thing for the, for the one below this, and the one below that. All right? So at this point here, uh, it's still actually not safe to physically delete this because we don't know whether there's a thread that's sitting at this location here and they start jumping down the tower and land to the bottom, right? So at this point, we've disconnected it from the, from the index and no, one will be, no new threads will be able to find us, but there may still be an existing thread that could find us and, and get tripped up, right? And then at some point, once I know it's safe, I can go ahead and completely remove it. Does that answer your question? Okay, yes? So how to detect, like, there's no threads? So his question is how to detect where there's no threads. That's garbage collection. We'll get to that in a second. Anything else? Yes? Um, like, before we actually got the selected, if we again enter the key, key by K5, how would that be? So his question is, if I'm here, uh, and someone comes along and tries to insert K5 back into it, mm -hmm. you just you create a new one. So his question is, or statement is that it can be in an inconsistent state. Let's say a thread is someone is searching for K five at the top. Yes. They try to traverse. Yes. Yeah, so, so say say you say it's like this, right? All right. I've marked it as deleted, but my pointer still point to it. Yeah. So so my thread is here, and then I do a compare and swap, and now that gets removed. Yeah. And then uh, you compare and swap, you remove the. The bottom one. So, you, so you're here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Next step. So, you're, and, and then someone. Yeah. Now, now you just encounter null, right? 
Sorry, sorry, sorry. The thread which is searching would, would, uh, would think that there is K5 when it started, but suddenly it, it cannot even reach the value of K5. No, it always can. It always can, always, always can get to it. When we do garbage collection, then when we do garbage collection, it's, it's like I know that there's nobody pointing to it because I've already done that. And I know there's no thread that could be hanging out here and following these pointers. So his question is, do you only set the, the logical flag, this delete flag, at the lowest level? Correct. It's only at the lowest level. You don't need it at the top. All right? How does the search know at the top that to skip over like a tower? So your question is, how does the search at the top know to skip over a tower? Yeah, like if five being deleted and so on. It, it doesn't. It has to go down. Like, so if I'm here, say, uh, the, 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 in, the skip list is at this state here. It's been marked as logically deleted. And I'm here, I don't know whether this is deleted yet, so I have to go down. And functionally, that's correct, right? I, I'm not going to get a false negative. I won't get a false positive. It's slightly more inefficient had I known that, all right, I can actually skip this and, and you know, not go all the way to the bottom. But you don't know that. And the additional metadata you would need in order to provide that hint is, is, is too much. So his question is, does the order for compare and swap matter? For insertion, yes. For insertion, you have to have, you have to install this thing first, right? Because otherwise you could have somebody come up. I don't want to get into linearizability, but like in the end, it's okay because there's high level constructs that like, like as you saw with the maintain serializability from a transactions point of view, that's okay. Uh, but for in terms of like, you know, what we're trying to avoid here is just having things point to like invalid you know, locations of memory have seg faults. So I think in general for when you do insertion, top, bottom to the top, deletion, top to the bottom. So his question is, um, when you're doing a deletion, do, do I try to, if I'm the thread doing the deletion, do I remove all of these pointers now, or does that happen later in garbage collection? The, the thread tries to do it now. So if he tries to do it now, maybe it's more of a if some other thread is like on the top tower, on the K5 on the top. Yes. And then you delete the. Yes. Like the, you delete, so you delete, you delete the, the pointers on the top. So, you be so, so you're, you're here. Yeah. Okay. Now, if you insert something like in front of the K5, if the other, if the, if the, like the thread that is searching has to go through that pointer, because the pointers, like you are updating now the, the pointer that's before the K5. Because you inserted something there, and now K5 logically doesn't see it. Well, physically doesn't exist anymore for the skip list. So we're going to be skipping that node instead of going to that node, and potentially you will, you'll miss that. Node. Okay, so I think, his, say we're at this point here. So his question is if I insert something between K4 and K5, say I insert K4.5, <laughs> right? So, and, and I'm, at, I'm, at, I'm at this state here. So I start at the top, top power, uh, the top level. I follow my pointer, I'm at the end, I know I don't want to go there. Then I jump down to the next level, uh, 4.5 is greater than, uh, than, than 2, so I go here. 4.5 is greater than 4, so then I go here. So now I'm here. I don't know whether, I don't know whether key, five, key 5 has been deleted yet, and I don't care. So I know that, all right, this points to 5, 4.5 is less than 5, so I want to go down here. Now I'm at 4, and my next key is 5, so I know I want to get inserted here. And depending on how many heads I get, I add my towers up, and that's still correct. There's no false negatives. Well, my point was, we can take this offline. Okay. My point is if you, if you insert after the K5. So I insert K5.5. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm at this point here. Uh, I would say, all right, I'm pointing to nothing. I can't do that. I would get here. 5.5 uh, is greater than K5. So I go down. 
5.5 is less than k6, so I know I want to insert here. So that's fine. It's installed. Everyone can see me, right? Uh, and because I'm going from the top down, this chain is still still correct, still find my entry. At some point, I'll do all my, my swaps. But again, at this point here, when I want to do compare and swap from k4 to make it point to not to k5 to the next one, it's not going to point to k6. It's going to end up pointing to 5.5, and I don't lose anything. Question over here? OK. So again, the, the careful thing about uh, skip list, when you build one, you, it's how you order the operations, uh, especially for inserts, can matter. Right? And again, when the, when you, you, the thread performs an operation, if the compare and swap fails because somebody else jumped ahead before you did, you can't abort that operation and say, I'm not doing it. You have to retry it. So it's up for you and your index implementation uh, that, you have to, you, that you're going to implement for the project too, that you have to support the ability to retry operations. Right? It's not like a, again, it's, it's not like a, a, a higher level transaction concept that we've been talking about before, where if I tried to, uh, to update a record and somebody else updated that thing before I did, and therefore that would violate serializable ordering because there's a write-write conflict or a read-write conflict, then I, I can abort that, that transaction and roll back to any of these changes. You can't do that for your index. The index should always be able to do whatever it is you, that you asked it to do. Now, if it's a unique index, uh, on, a, so on unique keys, and you try to insert something that's already there, then yes, that you, you report back, a, uh, you know, that you can't do it. But if I ask you to look up something or, or delete something or update something, uh, if you're not violating those, those, those invariants about uniqueness, then you should always be able to do it. All right, so uh, I'll go through these real quickly. I mean, I, I really wanted to get to the BW tree, um, but I guess because this is a project too, I'll, I'll, go, I'll go into this a bit more detail. Um, so the skip list that I'm showing here is like what you would implement, like as, as you know, if you're trying to learn from skip list for the first time, it's the most like basic vanilla one, uh, but it's actually very inefficient. Um, and so there's this great blog article by written some dude, I don't know who, who actually is, from 2016. I emailed him, asked him for his real name, never responded, whatever. Uh, and so he has this nice, it's, it's more engineering focused rather than academic or like a research blog article, but basically it says, here's how to build a real skip list to make it actually high performance. So he highlights four things that are real slow with a basic skip list implementation. So the first issue is that if you're flipping a coin with a random number generator, calling RAND is actually really slow because it has to maintain an internal state machine to figure out what's the next random value we should give you. And so there's actually a way to just do pure bit shifting operations to get pseudo random numbers that are good enough as, as RAND. Um, the other one is obviously reusing memory. Uh, if you have a node, it gets deleted, or entry in, in your index gets deleted. You can always reuse it rather than freeing it and malloking again. But the two things I want to talk about is how to handle uh, multiple keys in a single node, which is what he asked before about the B plus tree, and how to do reverse iteration. So the again, the way I've been I drew, I drew, drew the skip list is sort of you have every single entry, and every entry has a pointer to to its, its, its next neighbor, right? And this is obviously very inefficient because I'm storing a bunch of extra pointers that maybe I actually don't need to, right? And then also this is going to keep my memory fragmented because these these different uh, entries may not be contiguous in memory, so I may be hitting having a cache miss uh, every single time. Furthermore, it also sucks for modern CPUs because this indirection is going to cause us the, the branch predictor to, to do a bad job, and it's we may end up having to flush our execution pipeline in our CPU because we're just jumping to different random locations in memory, right? So the way we can solve this is by packing together a, uh, a bunch of keys into a single node. So typically what you want to do is try to get your single node to fit exactly in a single cache line. Can anybody tell me how big a cache line is? 64 bytes. Yes. So the in this case here, say that my keys are 32-bit integers. So I have four of them. Um, so that's four times eight. Uh, sorry, four times four, so that's 16 bytes. And then I have to have 64-bit uh, pointers, right? So that's eight bytes per pointer for four slots. So that's going to be 32 bytes. So that's together. That's going to be uh, 48 bytes. And then I have my another 64-bit pointer, another eight bytes for another pointer to the next guy. So that's 56 bytes. 
So I can put four entries into a single cache line, and that fits, you know, with an extra eight bytes uh, to store um, to store whatever additional metadata, like deletion flags and things like that. So now this is this is super efficient because it's a single, you know, cache line read to go retrieve this and put it into my CPU cache, and I can process this, you know, as needed. And so in this example here, what I'm also showing is that uh, we're not going to store the entries in sorted order, right? We just store them in, in the way that they are inserted. And that way, when, when I do my lookup here, I can't do binary search as I normally would if it was sorted. I just have to do a linear scan, but that's OK, because I only have four elements, and it's going to be my CPU cache, so that, that'll be efficient. All right, so if I want to do an insert, K4, I just go find the, the, the free slot that I have, and I go ahead and add it. And then if I want to do a lookup on K6, again, I just land to the head and do a linear scan to the find that I want. All right. The obvious downside of this is that, say I need to insert key 5 into this, um, it should go in between key 4 and key 6, and so I don't have any more entries here, so I have to move and copy some of this data out and put it into a new node. Right? And maybe what I want to do is borrow the nodes from, from my neighbor, right? but that, that's more tricky to do. So you'll get better performance when you do this. Um, it's the, the downside is that you may have to do extra copying to, to, to split a node, and you, you may have um, wasted space, because you may have a bunch of nodes that are half full, or you know or less than full. So you guys should definitely try to implement this uh, in, in, in your skit list for the class. It'd be interesting to see what, what, what the performance benefit you get from it. All right, and then the last thing you got to deal with is do reverse search. So as we said, the, the, because we're in a single, single, single direction linked list, you just can't start at the endpoint and try to walk your, your way back right, because there's no way to do this. Um, so there's a couple of different ways to actually do this. What I'm going to show you guys here is how to use a stack to do this. And this is from um, uh, an open source reference implementation written by some guy on GitHub, uh, where he you know, described how to use this algorithm with a stack. If you go read the MemSQL blog about how they do skip lists, there's like this one short paragraph that says, oh yeah, here's how to do it in reverse direction. Um, but it's not actually clear how to do this. When I asked the VP engineering of MemSQL, who is CMU alum, who's no longer there, I asked them what they do, and they claim they don't use a stack, and they maintain some extra pointers in the end to help them jump in reverse direction, but I never got a clear story exactly how, how they do this. Um, I should probably email them again, but whatever. Um, but in my opinion, the, the stack way is the easiest way to, th to think about this. OK, uh, so the way it works is that, say I want to do a lookup. Uh, K4 to K2. And so what I'll do is I know that my, uh, my boundary is, is for the lowest value is K2. So I'll just do a lookup on K2 to find where I need to be, where my starting point is for this range. So K2 is less than K5. Don't go there. Come down here. K2 equals K2. So I want to jump across and, and come down here. So now I'm at the starting point of my range. So what I'll do is I'll maintain a stack for every single entry that I hit until I hit my, up, my upper bound, K4, I'll just add the node or that key into my stack like, like that. right? And then when I reach the, the, the upper limit of my range, all I need to do now in my index wrapper is just traverse or spit out these, these keys in reverse order. So you have to maintain, again, a, a buffer for your thread, uh, a little, little memory space where you can add these entries and then know how to spit them out in, in, in reverse order. Okay. All right. So we have what? Twenty-five minutes left. When is this class end? Four twenty. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, so let, let's go through BW trees. So BW tree is the paper you guys read. Um, I, I think some of you were confused about what's actually going on. So I'll, I'll do the best I can to describe it. I would say that you were actually lucky because the first time I taught this class. Project two was not the skip list. Project two was the BW tree. And kids were like crying, and their eyes were bleeding. Um, so you only have to read the paper about it. We actually did the trouble of implementing it one uh, later. Um, but I think it's, it's worth to see the, the, the skip list juxtaposed with the, the BW tree, because the BW tree is another latch free data structure. Um, and it sort of it handles the compare and swap, it uses compare and swap in a different way, which I think, I think is interesting. Um, so the big problem we had, again, with the skip list is that uh, we can't have, we can't update multiple pointers at the same time. 
So we can only have our, our, our linked list go in one direction. And this also means that we can't build a lat tree B plus tree because, again, they have pointers in, in different locations. And if we want need to do a, um, if we had to do a split or merge, that's a major change. We have to update a lot of pointers. And then we can't do that atomically. So the solution that they propose in the BW tree is to introduce an indirection layer that will allow us to change these multiple addresses atomically, even though we're still confined to using compare and swap, which can technically only update one address at a time. So the BW tree is a lat tree B plus tree index uh, that came out of the Hecaton project from Microsoft. Um, and the, again, the goal with this is, again, can they build a, a, a cache-friendly um, uh, data structure that need to be order preserving for their in memory, in memory uh, execution engine. And as I said, I think last class, the, they were originally looking at skip lists, found a bunch of problems with it, why it actually wasn't scalable, and then they went off and build, built their own data structure here. So there's two key ideas about a, that a BWG you need to understand. Right? And this is the, sort of the whole enchilada, the whole, the whole higher level concept of what this thing actually does. So the first is that they don't want to have any in place updates to any node in the, in the data structure. So instead, they're going to introduce these delta chains that allow you to make changes to a node with, by just appending the change to some list rather than going down and reorganizing memory. Right? And they do this to make it cache friendly because if I have a copy of my, of my, uh, my you know, index node or B plus tree node at every single uh, CPU, uh, if I go make a change at one thread, I got to go invalidate that copy everywhere. Right? The other thing is that they're going to use a mapping table that is going to allow them to do compare and swap in a single location uh, to identify the phys single physical location of a page, but have that automatically propagated throughout the entire data structure. So let's look at an example here. So here's a really simple uh, B BW tree. We, ha we have three pages. Um, and so the first thing we're going to point out is that I'm gonna, in my these diagrams, I'm going to distinguish between the logical pointers and the physical pointers, OK? So the logical pointers are going to all be based on these page IDs. So every page, when it gets instantiated and put into the index, is assigned some unique page number. And then in our mapping table, we're going to map the page ID to the actual physical address in memory of where that page is located. Right? And each page can only exist in one place at a time. So right? there's only one address for it. right? So then what happens is anytime I want to say, where's you know, page 102, I look at my mapping table, and I get the physical address for it. Internally, the way it's going to have these logical pointers, again, instead of storing physical addresses, we just need the, the page IDs. So for this top page here, right, this was what, 101, right? It has a child 102 and a child 104. If I ever need to get down here, I just need to go look at the mapping table. It says, I want page 102. Where is it? Voila, here it is. Right? So let's see how they handle updates. So let's start. We say we have a single page, right? Anytime I make a change, like I, I insert or delete a key, then I'm not going to make it, you know, modify the actual page itself. Like the base page is immutable. Once it's created, it's never changed. But instead, when we, to apply a change to it, we're going to add a new delta record. So every base page is going to have this thing called a delta chain sort of in, 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 as a prefix to it, uh, where you can, you, can make, you, know, you can apply or install new delta changes. So let's say I want to insert key 50. And key 50 should be contained in page 102. I won't change the actual page. I'll make this new delta record and says, here, I'm inserting key 50. And then now what I need to do uh, is have the, the, the delta record have a physical pointer to the base page. And then I want to do a compare and swap now to install the pointer to my delta chain as now the, the, the new location of this page. So for page 102, I want to do a compare and swap and now have it now point to delta chain, the, the, the head of the delta chain starting with this, this record here. So now if any other thread does a lookup and says, I want to get to page 102, when they follow the, map, the mapping table, they're going to land this delta record. And they have to do you know, a check in some, you know, some flag in the header that says the thing you're looking at is not really a base page, it's actually a delta record. And then they'll have to apply that change uh, in like an internal memory representation as if they're like replaying the log uh, to put it back in the state, put page 102 in the state that it should have been. 
So I can keep doing this. If I, if I want to now delete a key, same thing. I'll, I'll make a new delta record. I'll have it point to now the, the head of the version chain, which is the delta record I created before. I do my compare and swap, and now this thing is the head of the delta chain. Yes? Is having like a centralized like, mapping table like a big bottleneck? His question is, is having a centralized mapping table a big bottleneck in terms of what? In terms of threads trying to get into the same thing? Or like when you have a lot of cores all trying to touch like the same centralized data structure. Yeah, so, so his question is, uh, could you have a lot of cores all trying to touch, either access or modify the same data structure, does that become a bottleneck? Yes, and we'll see that next class. Um, it, yes, I mean, think about this, like in, in the, the skip list, as you're going along, like your pointer is like, ah, here's where I need to go. You know exactly where you need to go. Every single time you want to traverse in the, in the BW tree, you got to do a look up in this mapping table and then jump to that location. Yeah, and that, that becomes a bottleneck. Yes. All right, let's see how to do a search in this example here. All right. So I'm only showing one, you know, one page here, but again, it's, 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 a, it's a tree structure. So we'll traverse the tree just like we would in a regular B plus tree. Right? All the leaf nodes actually contain the, 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 all the keys and values. But then as we do a lookup in a mapping table to say to get to page one or two, right, if we land in a virgin chain, we got to start looking at what the actual the, the, those, those deltas of records are doing to figure out whether they correspond to the thing that we're looking up. So in this case here, if I'm trying to see, you know, get me key 50, I do my lookup mapping table, I land here, this deletes 48, I don't care about that. I follow the pointer now here, this inserts key 50, aha, that's exactly what I'm looking for, so I'm done. I don't need to go all the way to the bottom. I have exactly what, I'm, what I need. But if I don't, then I have to go down now down the base page and do a binary search. But I have to apply all the changes that I saw as I traversed the delta chain uh, into my base page and a copy that I have that's specific to my thread in order to find the thing that I want. So with the compare and swap being done on the map ta mapping table, this is again a single location that we, we we only need to maintain to figure out you know whether I'm allowed to install my change, right? So let's say I have two threads trying to install a new delta record to this 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 chain here at the same time, right? So I have this guy wants to delete key 48, and this guy wants to insert key 16. When I do my compare and swap on my mapping table, only one of these threads will succeed. So let's say that the first guy does compare and swap and he gets it. So now this is part of the, the version chain. This compare and swap will fail. So then it has to abort its operation, retry, and try, and try to apply the change again. And maybe this time it, it'll, it'll be able to succeed. Right? So it's like the skip list where if your compare and swap fails, you have to go back and, and, and traverse everything and retry. Yes? Pepper snap, it doesn't retry. What's that? Say it again? If paper is out, it doesn't retry. Yeah, so, so his statement is uh, if this insert 16 fails, you could do the lookup again, figure out what this points to, and then try to do compare and swap it directly into this again. Yes. That, that's, that's, a, that's one shortcut way to do this. Yes. And not so, the way that paper does. What's that? It's not the way that paper does. Yeah. So uh, as an aside, I'll say the paper leaves um, a lot of implementation details uh, undescribed, or they don't mention, like, I want you to read the paper to get the high level idea of what, what they're actually doing. Uh, when you actually try to build a real one, that paper is insufficient, right? There's a bunch of stuff that they leave out. Now, they have a bunch of papers that come after this that are, you know, a part of the Hecaton project or Deuteronomy, which is another system out of Microsoft. And they sprinkle in little tidbits about like, oh, yeah, you got to do this in your BW tree. You got to do that in your BW tree, right? Uh, but some things, again, are not clearly specified. But then the paper that I sent the email out on Sunday that we just had accepted to Sigmod, that's like, here's how to build it for real. We fill in all the missing gaps. It's way more details than you actually need to care about, but like there's a bunch of stuff you need to know how to do this all correctly. And it's actually it becomes a big issue when you actually do structural modifications. Okay. So to finish up, uh, in addition, so there's different categories of delta records. So the ones I've been showing so far is when you make changes to the actual key value space, right? Insert, update, or deletes. Um, but you can also have delta records that handle structural modifications, right? It's, a, it's like a B plus tree. So it means we have to do splits and merges, right? So we got to we got to be handled that. So the first thing we got to be able to handle is do consolidation. So 
if we just let this delta chain record grow forever, then it's essentially going to you know, become like even worse than the linked list that I showed before because I have to look at every single record in my delta chain and figure out whether the thing I'm looking for is actually there. So what will happen is you set a threshold to say my delta chain can only get so long and if a thread comes along and it realizes, oh, I'm trying to apply a new delta record and I can't because the delta chain is too long, I want to try to consolidate it. So that essentially means taking all the changes that you made uh, and applying it to the base page and to, to, to a new memory location. So in this case here, I would copy the base page, right, new page 102, and then for every single delta, delta record I have, going in reverse order, I apply them one by one, right? So after I'm done that, now this base page is logically equivalent to this base page here with all its delta records applied to it. So again, same thing, I do a compare and swap now to uh, flip this pointer now to point, point to, to my new guy here. And the nice thing about compare and swap is when you, do, when you try to do it, you, 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 you want to make sure that nobody else tried to insert another delta record that you didn't apply to your, your new copy of the base page. So you know that if this thing still points to the head of the version chain that you saw when you, when you created this new node, then you know there's no other new delta record. So therefore, you got everything, and then therefore, you're, you're safe to do this. Right? And you can be clever about certain things, like if my compare and swap fails because somebody else inserted something above this, then I can go maybe figure, figure out what that was and apply those things and try to compare and swap again. Yes? Um, what if some uh, values are disputed, or some duplicate values are disputed in the sum of delta and base page? Your question is, what happens if a duplicate value disappears? Appears in different delta and the base page. Because you said, uh, basically, we have one version of delta, which is not a refined return. Ah, OK. So his question is, so I have insert key 50 here. Say I have delete key 50 here, what happens? No, it's, I have an insert 50 in the first delta and also have a 50 in the base page. Uh, so, so, so the question is, what if I have 50 here? Yes. Uh, Am I going to be missing something? No, so when, to do the, it's like, I mean, you have to do the normal check if I go back to my insert example. Um, here. At this point, okay, so I, I want to do insert 50. I have to check to see whether that key is there anyway to see whether I'm allowed to do that, right? And then if it's, if it's there, then if I'm, if I'm a unique index, so I can't do that, I have to abort, right? And again, the beauty of compare and swap, if I compare and swap now and I succeed, meaning I, I, the mapping table did point to the base page, my compare and swap succeeded, I know there's no other delta record that, that came before me, because the pointer is pointing to the base page, right? So you won't have any uh, incorrect duplicate entries. What if it is at, uh, at the leaf node? This question is, what if this is at the leaf node? Yeah. You're actually inserting a tuple, yeah. It's, it, it's all still the same. It doesn't matter whether it's a leaf node or, or, or an inner node, right? You have to always do the, the, the same checks. So. Yeah, so say this is the leaf node, and, and I'm trying to insert key 50 and have, you know, to actually point to a data record. In the leaf node, I would see whether it succeeds or not. Um, and then if I have to do a split now uh, because my node got too big, then the same thing applies up above when I try to. When I do. Let me, let me jump ahead to structural modifications, but it all, the same concept applies everywhere. Yes? One of the issues that you said, the T trees had was you had to do two memory uh, references every time you you do a lookup. Yes. Uh, wouldn't the same issue, same problem have uh, you here as well? Because once you look into the a mapping table, and then you go and look into the. Uh... So his so his, so his comment was, I said in the beginning that in T trees, in order to do any any key lookup, uh, you always have to follow the pointer to the, to the actual tuple itself and then find the thing that you want, right? And in this case here, you're doing a bunch of extra lookups because uh, you have to, I mean, it's actually more than just two because like you have to, depending on how your hash table is implemented, you have to maybe jump a bunch of different locations. Yes, but this can be easily made concurrent, easily in quotes, it's possible, we did it, it's not easy. Uh, but in the T tree, it's not easy to do this in, in sort of in a 
with like fine grain latching the same way you can do this in, in, a, in a BW tree. Actually, BW tree doesn't have any latches. Yeah. Yes. The reason why we do like data updates is because like it's uh, cache friendly. Yes. But it doesn't like save any cost. And, and actually, you know, like additionally, like you can create some cost. Like you have to traverse all the data. Yeah. So, so his comment is that uh, because they're having these delta records, uh, I'm not making changes to the base pages. Uh, and that saves on cache invalidations. But in exchange for getting that property, I have to execute more instructions and potentially do more reads in memory to figure out how to have this mapping. Correct, yes. That, that's a classic computer science trade-off. OK. So we got this, we got consolidation. So let's talk about how to do uh, garbage collection here. And this is actually related to how you do garbage collection on a skip list, and I'll cover this in more detail on, on Wednesday's class. So the, the way they're going to handle this, the, again, the, the high-level idea here is that they need to figure out when is a location of memory, like a, some, some node, or, or it's, and its delta chain, when does it know that no other thread could be accessing it at, at that moment in time, right? And the way you're going to handle this is through, through epoch garbage collection. So this, is, this, this idea of epochs is not specific to uh, BW tree, right? This is also called R RCU in, in Linux. This is how they do, they, they do garbage collection for their data structures. Um, so uh, what I'm describing here is it's still applicable to how you would do this in a skip list. So the basic idea is that any time a thread wants to do an operation in the index, you have to tell this sort of, you have to figure out what, what epoch am I in. Right? And the, can this just be a logical counter that's always increasing? And the idea is that when you recognize that there's, garbage, there's data now or nodes now that are now garbage, meaning in my, my previous case here, I did my consolidation, and now this thing points to this, I know I, 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 I want to reclaim this memory here. The idea is that you know, what all, you know what all threads are inside your index doing something at a given epoch. They create garbage, and that garbage is tagged with that current epoch. And then at some later point, when you know that no other thread is in that epoch or any prior epoch, you know no other thread could be pointing or looking at that data, so therefore it's safe for you to reclaim it, right? So let's look at an example here. So again, this is, this is the example I just did where I would do consolidation, right? So say I have one thread and one CPU, he's doing all the consolidation work. So when I, when I first entered the index, we, we would have to add it to this epoch table. And for now, we just assume we have only one epoch, right? But you can obviously have multiple ones because you, you, like in silo, you tick this off every 40 milliseconds. It doesn't, doesn't matter what it actually is. So then let's say I have now another thread, though. He's also in this epoch, and he's now scanning down this version chain, right? and he's applying all the changes, and he's trying to figure out, you know, do, do I have the data that I need? So... This consolidation finishes in this thread. We do a compare and swap, so now 102 is now here. And this thread knows that this thing is garbage because nobody can point to it anymore because I changed the mapping table. So it's going to add it to the epoch table, but the epoch table is going to, the, the epoch manager is going to know, all right, for this epoch, I still have uh, two threads inside of it. CPU is done, it goes away, and it gets removed from the epoch table. But it knows that two is still hanging out here. So it has to wait until this thing finishes whatever it's doing. Even if it follows now another pointer and looks at an another node, it's still in the epoch, so we can't free this memory, memory yet. Because again, if we go free up memory, then this thing can now be pointing to whatever, and that's incorrect. So when this thread drops out, then we know it's safe to actually delete this entirely. Same idea applies in your skip list. You would know what threads are in, in a given epoch. You mark things logically as deleted with that little flag. You, you remove the pointers, but some threads still may be hanging out in it. And then once everyone, all the threads exit that epoch and all prior epochs, then it's safe to go ahead and delete it. Yes? Can this be done by setting the epoch, uh, when you set the flag, deleted flag to true? Just set the epoch at which this flag was set to true. 
and once you know there are no transactions which which have an epoch le- uh, and tag each transaction with, an e- with the epoch at which it started and once you know that the epoch of all the transactions are greater than the e- of the deleted epoch you know it's safe to delete your so your statement is when it, when I mark when I mark a node in the skip list case as as an entry is being deleted, I tag it with an epoch number, right. and any thread that shows up gets an epoch number. Right. And once I know that all the threads with epoch less than that tag gets deleted, it's safe for me to delete it. Uh, any all the threads have an epoch greater than the tag. Yeah, they just say delete it. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. So that's the same thing with an epoch of like one, right? This is allows you to be, you, you, you can sort of batch things up more carefully, um, or, or in, in, in more coarse grain or broader epochs. It's basically the same idea. All right, in the sake of time, I'm going to skip structural modifications because this is the worst. People hate this. Look how hard it is, right? Let's skip this. Okay, let's get the numbers. Trust me, it works. It's hard. All right, so this is the numbers that they reported in their paper from 2013. Uh, and so they have a bunch of internal, uh, they have some, some, some workload from the Xbox Live uh, application. They have a synthetic workload and a deduplication de- 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 workload. And they're comparing their BW tree with a B plus tree from Berkeley DB, which at this time and even now is not a state of the art implementation. Berkeley DB came out in 1992, right? Um, and they, bit of, so they basically bit some stuff to make it store everything in memory, right? Still, but it's still not considered a high performance modern implementation. And then they have their, their basic implementation. I guess this is the first, their, their, their skip list that they were trying out uh, when they were building Hackathon. And as you can see across all these workloads, the, the BW tree crushes all of it, right? So I saw this in 2013 or so, I'm like, oh yes. I'm going to Carnegie Mellon, let's build a BW tree. This is what I want to do, right? <laughs> so we did that. Uh, and then instead of using Berkeley DB, we actually implemented a, a modern in-memory B plus tree um, using optimistic lock coupling. So this is running on a machine here at CMU. Uh, it's only running, for this experiment, it's only a single socket with 10 cores with hyper-threading. So it's 20 active threads at, at a time trying to, trying to do something in the index. And then we're going to do a, a, a data set of 50 million keys, Ziffian distribution that are, that are 64-bit integers. Um, and so what you see is that the, the skip list does really fast for the insert operations versus the, sorry, the BW, or BW tree does, does really well for insert only operations. Um, but for the read only and the read update workloads, it loses to the B plus tree. Um, and then for this skip list, sorry, take that back. Yeah, that might be wrong. Read update skip list. Let me double check that. Um, I might've flipped the numbers. Uh, so, the skip list we're using is actually a super modern implementation from uh, Alan Fecky in Australia. It's called a rotating skip list. It uses wheels instead of towers. Right. Same idea. Um, so, so this is the best skip list that's available now. And our BW tree beats it, but the B plus tree beats it. And then what I'll talk about next, next class is when we start throwing these other data structures in, like mass tree and art, then the BW tree gets crushed, right? And the thing to point out, though, is for all for the, the B plus tree, the mass tree, and the art index, these are not latch free indexes. They're using latches, right? And so the main takeaway here, and we'll, we'll do a breakdown uh, of the BW tree when you start. You know, if you re- if you remove the map- mapping table, how much faster do you get? Uh, we'll do things like that. But in general, a latch tree data structure, at least according to the current research, is not the best way to actually implement an in memory index. Right? If you do latching in a careful way, as in the case of mastery, art, and, uh, and the B plus tree, you actually can get better performance on highly concurrent workloads. Right? So lat tree you know, is, in, is in vogue. It seems like the hot thing that everybody wants, right? lock-free algorithms and all this. Right? It's actually, for this, for this particular uh, uh, scenario, it's not the best. So we'll, get, we'll, we'll cover these indexes in more detail uh, next class. But this is a sort of preview to say, Everything I talk about today is hard. You have to build a skip list for, for the project because I have to give you a grade. But if you go out in the real world and try to build an in-memory database, you may want to use these other ones. OK? OK. So this other overarching thing about in the skip list, which I think is kind of interesting, is that 
or it, it, actually for, for all these indexes, is that it's essentially like a mini database inside of a database. We have to worry about garbage collection. We have to worry about versions. We have to worry about uh, uh, visibility things, right? And then the nice thing I like about Cicada, again, is that the index are just tables, so you don't have to re-implement all these things yourself. You get that for free because you already had to implement it for your, for your, 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 your data tables. Um, the non-concurrent skip list is easy to implement. The BW tree is hard. Um, and the performance benefit you get from the, from the BW tree of the skip list is not, uh, is not worth the extra, the extra pain. So I'll say, too, also in the paper you guys read, they talk about logging the BW tree deltas to, to, a, to an SSD, to a flash drive. And that's actually one of the, 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 the key advantages you do get from a BW tree uh, in that scenario, because it's just logging out the delta chain records, and you can do that sequentially. So in a environment where you do want the index backed by a, a disk, a BW tree actually might be a, right, a good choice. But for pure in memory, our research shows that it's not. OK? All right, we're well over time. Wednesday, we're going to add back Lactis. We'll also talk about other things uh, you need to have in your uh, implementation. And if we have time, we'll do, talk about how to do performance testing. OK? Any questions? All right. So let's gamble. Who says the, the stream will be stuck? Mmm, I need something refreshing when I get finished manifesting. Too cold, a whole bowl like Smith and Wesson. One court, and my thoughts hip hop related. Write a rhyme, and my pen's intoxicated. Lyrics are quicker with a sip of more liquor. Since I'm a city slicker, brain waves are quicker. Rhymes I create rotate at a way too quick to duplicate. Fill a breeze at a skate. Mics at Fahrenheit when I hold it real tight. When I'm in flight, then we ignite. Blood starts to boil. I heat up the party for you. Let my girl rub me and my mic down with oil Wreck still turns with third degree burn for one man I heat up your brain, give it a suntan So just cool, let the temperature rise To cool it off with St. Ives